Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. I am pleased to welcome you to a two-part series. We're very fortunate to have a very highly qualified guest today to deal with a book that came out last year. And both our programs are going to be about that book and also other issues that he is very involved in. The title of this book is Visible Differences, Why Race Will Matter to Americans in the 21st Century. And I have a copy of it here. It's both in hardback and in uh, uh, paperback. A little bit about our guest. Our guest is Dominic Polera. Uh, he comes to us from Wisconsin. And as I said, he's here to uh, deal with his book. He spent seven years researching all of this very, very in-depth topic. He interviewed hundreds of people, and he went to many places, including all 50 states in our country, and plus uh, visits to Spain, Italy, Japan, Greece, Russia, Brazil, Canada, Mexico, Sweden, Turkey, Argentina, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, and the Dominican Republic. His book is published by Continuum Books with offices in London and New York. He's working on a second book now called Sharing the Dream, White Males in Multicultural America. Dominic, welcome to the program. It's, we've had you here today to speak to a very uh, good audience at our college, and thanks for your coming to be on this program. We appreciate it very much. It's nice to be here, Tony. Thank you for having me. And I must say that there's a lot of firsts on this program, which has been going 34 years, and I believe that we've never had an author on the program before that's gone to that many countries to research their book. And I should tell our viewers, it has 95 pages of footnotes. You are to be commended for being such a scholar. And again, welcome to the program. And I'm very pleased to have two panel members today. First of all is Denise Clark, who is a librarian at North Idaho College. And next to her is Erna Reinhardt, Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College. And I will invite Denise Clark to commence today's questioning. Um, Dominic, why this particular book? I, I think this is certainly the most detailed a description of uh, ethnicity in the United States I have ever encountered in, in my readings. But I wondered when I was reading, why this particular book? Why this topic? What, what drove you, you know, to, to write this, this book? I, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. As someone who has grown up in the United States, there are no other topics, in my opinion, like race, that go to the very heart of the American experience, what it means to be an American, and who we are as a people, and where we're going as a nation and a people. Now, my personal experiences are such that ever since I was a little boy, I've been interested in the topic, and as I became older, I was fortunate to have opportunities to speak to people from different groups and listen to them and learn from them, and also to see many different places and, and to read many articles, many books, and so forth. Now, one would say, there are so many books out there about race. Like, like you said, wh why another one? I mean, wh why, why create any more uh, material for uh, libraries? And my answer would be this. There's an incredible amount of fine work that has been done on race and continues to be done on race. Much of the work on the topic focuses on specific issues or specific groups, and until recently, uh, most of the treatments focused on blacks and whites in our country. As we all know, the uh, situation is, uh, in terms of race relations and ethnic relations has become uh, very complex in the last 10 to 15 years. So I tried to uh, create a treatment of the topic that took into account the full ethnic and racial diversity of our nation. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. Welcome, Dominic. Um, tell us a little bit, because this book is, is very unique and it is very different and it's very, very thorough. Tell us about uh, the methodology that you used to do your research and the length of time that you spent on your research. Tell us how, how you put the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question, and if I may, just add one more thing about what makes the book somewhat unusual, and that is that I try to be neutral. I try to set different perspectives side by side. Anyone who writes about the topic, of course, is genu generally motivated by a belief in inclusion and a belief that our nation's ethnic and racial diversity is one of our, our great strengths. And I certainly count myself 
as a member of that group. I have no question about it. One can't spend seven years on, on the topic and not really love this country and all the people in it. Now, in terms of my methodology, what I tried to do was I tried to draw upon scholarly sources, the best scholarly work available, while not getting into the academic turf battles over issues. In other words, that's why I'd like to say that the book blends the popular and the academic, because very scholarly works will often get into great detail, and it's important work, great detail on the literature out there and uh, the different perspectives that different scholars have expressed uh, on various occasions. What I did was I, I draw upon the work, and the notes reflect all the debts I have to other people with come before me, but at the same time try to write it in such a way that the typical American would find it hopefully a little bit interesting at least, and intersperse lots of anecdotes, lots of vignettes about various communities uh, in our country and various people to try to leaven the mix, so to speak, uh, as opposed to just doing like straight analysis of every topic. And it's my belief that in our communities and in vignettes about particular people, one can also draw oftentimes conclusions about the, the big picture, so to speak. Yeah. Awesome. In relation to my question, I go back to Denise, and I was really happy to hear her say that. She is uh, a remarkable person herself. In my 16 years of serving with her as a colleague, it's amazing how every book that you mention she knows about. So she's a great reviewer. And in addition to what she said, some of the reviews I've read indicates that they too agree that this is the most comprehensive work that's been done in this country on this issue. And so I think that's an important thing for our viewers to know about possibly reading the book. Would you be so kind as to share with our viewers the five uh, ethnic racial groups that are featured in the book? And I know that you've gone back actually hundreds and hundreds of years in looking at this historical development. But I'm thinking of the viewers who might be reading the book and share with them um, that content. It's a very important point. Uh, since the 1970s, uh, the government uh, created a, in the 1970s, the government, the United States government created a classification schema that takes into account much of our ethnic and racial diversity. Uh, the groups are whites defined as people who are, um, whose ancestors come from Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. Uh, black people or African Americans defined as people whose ancestors come from Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Latinos. Now, Latinos, interestingly, the, uh, the schema designates, uh, uh, designates them as an ethnic group, not a racial group, but oftentimes in America, Latinos are considered as uh, to be a mutually exclusive racial group, even though people from every race are Latino. But anyway, Latinos, anybody who is descended from uh, people who come from a Spanish-speaking country in, in the world, uh, people of Asian ancestry would be uh, anyone from the continent of Asia, excluding Middle Easterners who are defined as white. And then finally, American Indians or Native Americans, of course, people who are descended from the original inhabitants of the lands that now make up the United States. Now, the categories have become increasingly complex, and appropriately so, to take into account all the people. I mean, we, we're at, uh, I think, 292 million Americans now. And some Americans, of course, are multiracial, biracial, and they don't want to and deny one part of their heritage. So in the last census, we had the, the multiracial category. There's a multiracial option. Uh, there's an option that you can check some other race if none of the, the categories fit you. And some of our, uh, uh, some Arab Americans, uh, some Americans of Middle Eastern ancestry don't feel that any of the existing categories work for them. So some of them would check uh, some other race. And generally, these categories, some people even want to do away with them, but these categories are, are kind of how most people in this country see themselves and how they organize themselves. Uh, various programs, um, educational institutions, uh, contracting opportunities, diversity initiatives in corporate America and elsewhere uh, use these categories to define who is a member of the majority, typically white people, non-Hispanic white people, and then who are the members of minority groups. 
So it's certainly <coughs> it's in, it's within our whole system and culture, and certainly in the political arena and public policy, it's, it's been recognized. Uh, based on that, I have one more follow-up question before I go back to the panel, uh, and that is that at one point you've indicated that uh, the two communities, the, the white or Caucasian community and the African-American, where it was black-white issues a lot, and we're having a, we're having a tremendous change in the demographics of our population. So uh, I, first a comment that's impressed me about your book because you're recognizing all of that. And, and secondly, the question would be, uh, since the, we have two communities now, African American, Latino, or Hispanic, that are m very large population-wise minority communities, how's that changing the, the demographics in the face of our country? In the last couple of years, the numbers have shown that people who are Latino are now more numerous in our country than African Americans. And this change in terms of the demographics is playing out in numerous ways. At the same time, but before I, if I may, before I get into some of those changes that are occurring, we have to keep in mind that f for a, a long part of our nation's history, the relationship between whites and blacks defined race relations in this country. <coughs> and that hasn't changed. I mean, that hasn't changed. It's changing to some extent, but it hasn't changed completely. And there are a lot of issues on the American agenda that continue to be informed by black-white relations. So it's very important that we keep in mind that those issues continue to matter, as the recent debate over reparations indicates. And part of why we need to stay focused uh, to some extent, of course, on black-white relations is that there are issues related to race that affect African Americans uh, more so than people from other groups. We have a history of slavery and segregation. I, I don't want to get, get into uh, comparisons about who experienced more <coughs> discrimination or more racism, or experiences, I should say, as well, in the present. but. Slavery and segregation were experiences that affected blacks, African Americans. Uh, many of the people of color who are coming here today, uh, they, I mean, the United States does have a history in parts of the country where there was periodic discrimination against people of Latin American ancestry and uh, some vicious uh, discrimination against non-black people of color, including, of course, Native Americans. In a national sense, uh, white Indian issues, as in white Native American issues, tend not to receive a lot of attention, in part because the Native American population is about, it's a little under 1%, and it's very significant, uh, the white Native American relationship in a number of our states and communities, uh, such in South Dakota, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, and a number of other places. But the numbers aren't there as there are uh, for the black community. In other words, Black Americans are 12 to 13 percent of the population, just like with Latinos. Now, shifting to how race relations are changing because of the increasing numbers of uh, non-black people of color. The 1990 census, by the way, was the first in American history in which uh, non-black people of color outnumbered African Americans. At the same time, by 2000 or thereabouts, people debate about when it exactly happened, but in recent times, there are now more Latinos than blacks. So we're seeing what's happening with the demographics. Now, how is this playing out? It's a legitimate question. We have to look at it nationally. Uh, take our, our political scene, for instance. Uh, political figures increasingly make a concerted effort to reach out to Latino voters, in part uh, because many of them are concentrated in critical states such as California, Texas, and Florida. And also, we're starting to see, in another important indicator, our popular culture, we're starting to see sitcoms on the major networks, such as uh, George Lopez, that take into account the Latino American experience. Sometimes people who aren't familiar with any aspects of Latino America will assume that, assume erroneously that uh, many people of Latin American ancestry are recent arrivals here in the United States, and that many of them would be uh, they would have their needs uh, taken care of by the Spanish language media. And the fact of the matter is that uh, the Spaniards came here 
in the 16th century. They established the first permanent European settlement uh, in St. Augustine, Florida in 1565. Uh, they were in the southwest uh, from the 1600s on. And as people from uh, Latin backgrounds became incorporated in the United States through conquest and other means and immigration, what has happened is, particularly in the last 30 years, that what was once a phenomenon mainly limited to the Southwest in states such as New Mexico and California, which have you know, always had, and Arizona and Texas, always had long established Latino presences, this has become a national issue. Uh, in my home state of Wisconsin, which is not known for being a bastion of ethnic and racial diversity, there are uh, Mexican stores in some small, formerly monocultural, monoracial towns. And that's happening in many parts of our country. Um, and at the local level, the demographic changes uh, that are resulting in ha our, our population of Latinos, that it's growing so rapidly, have in some parts of America uh, led to some tensions with African Americans. Now, I don't want to over-exaggerate this because there are issues on which uh, blacks and Latinos work together. Like, for instance, in the state of California where there have been tensions at the local level, you're going to have representatives of both communities joining together to support affirmative action in university admissions. But at the local level, uh, one of the things that plays out, and there have been conflicts between blacks and Latinos in such places as Los Angeles, Dallas, Miami, and elsewhere, one of the things that makes these relationships so interesting, or, or this, re this particular relationship so interesting, is that African Americans vote in large numbers. And of course, politicians pay attention to those who vote. And many Latinos uh, are not yet naturalized citizens, because even though we have a long Latino American presence, many people are first or second generation. And the African American population in places like California, they vote in large numbers. And you may have a district that's 60% Latino and 30% black, but a majority of the voters are black. And to some extent, you sometimes see a disconnect between the demographics and some of the policies. And I'm not saying that black and Latino interests are mutually exclusive. They're not. But in some cases, Latinos will look at the police force in a given area and say, we want to see more Hispanic officers. We want to see more Spanish-speaking officers. And it, uh, the schools, uh, employment, public employment, those are two big issues that uh, result in some conflicts, sometimes not. Sometimes people work together. So there are some areas in which they are starting to get in other areas where they aren't, and that'll show in the future politics. I want to get back to the needs and let her have another round. Oh, well, I was, I was uh, interested in your comment on, on the media, and one of my uh, observations seems to be that we get mixed messages from, mm -hmm. from the media. In, in some instances, that it, it, they, the media appears to exacerbate um, um, issues, uh, you know, um, situations between the races. Uh, it may even, you know, to some instance, act as a, a goad almost to, you know, racism. And in other instances, with uh, all of the sitcoms that they, where there are uh, great representations of um, Latino or uh, black families. Uh, so I, I wondered if you would care to comment on your views of the role the media has played in this kind of conflict, mm -hmm. <laughs> conflicted view, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, that's a very important issue because all of us uh, are affected by the products, mm -hmm. you know, the cultural products that are out there and uh, television, uh, films and, and music and such. The, the so-called mainstream media uh, come under fire from so many different sides uh, for either being uh, insensitive uh, to the, uh, the needs of people of color, viewers of color, readers of color, listeners of color, and also uh, sometimes for being, and from some predominantly white conservatives, for being too liberal, having a, a liberal bias. Um, in terms of what has happened in the media, we have a long way to go. There's no question about it. Uh, scholars have looked at newscasts and tried to examine uh, the extent to which the media may foster stereotypes about criminality and young African-American men. And that's an issue on which uh, 
the, the mainstream media have been criticized over the years. Um, and w I think we're starting to see some progress in that regard. I don't want to exaggerate too much, but that executives and programming people are conscious about the fact that if they're running a story on crime, this is a, a country that's still nearly 70 percent white. We, we, we need to see white faces. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fellow, I think, he's, I think he's in Milwaukee, and he's a black gentleman, and he has a radio show on a, a station with a predominantly black listenership, and to mock the mainstream media's tendency, in his opinion, to stereotype uh, African Americans in this regard. Every morning he began running what he described as a white crime report. I, I may have the name off a little bit, oh, but, great. but what he would do was he would look at like the police blotters in predominantly white communities in and around Milwaukee and then he would in the morning start speaking about what some of these white people had done. And he said once in a while, once in a while he got it wrong because of course in the police blotter they're not going to say so and so's white and you know did this to another white person, but he was going on the de based on the demographics and I thought that was a humorous way of, of dealing with that, that stereotype. Um, I think it was four years ago that there were real protests because when the, the networks released their fall programming, I mean, there were no, I mean, th there was just a, a marked paucity of, of actors of color in any main, main roles. And that was only four years ago. That won't happen again because there was such an outcry that sometimes what happens is because people who do programming, they're, they're not necessarily bad people, I mean at all. I mean, but what happens is sometimes people get in what, kind of in their own world and like, uh, and they focus on people they know and because many of the programming people are white, oftentimes um, you're going to see portrayals that are largely white. Like, for instance, um, Arsenio Hall once joked that he thought that the uh, very popular show Friends, he, he was surprised to find out it was set in New York City. He, he thought it was like set in northern Utah or something, as he put it. Because of, you know, the dem we know the demographics of New York City and we also know the demographics of, of Friends. And that was one of those instances where uh, some of our friends on the left might describe it, uh, if you'll permit me to say this, like as a whitewash or something. I mean, you know, use a term like that to be kind of humorous, to try to make light of that. Um, in terms of uh, the mainstream media, we've seen other outlets uh, develop in response to the fact that people, a number of people in our society feel as if their viewpoints aren't expressed by like the, the major television networks and such. We have uh, black entertainment television and uh, a number of, of radio stations around the country in particular that have predominantly black audiences. Now, a very interesting topic has to do with English dominant Latinos. Because there are some, as I said before, who erroneously think that Latinos, all Latinos are catered to by the Spanish language media. And that's not true. There are many people, uh, many, many Hispanics in our country who they may speak Spanish, they may understand Spanish, or, and they may be more comfortable in English, or they toggle back and forth between the two languages. And they want to see programming on the, the major television networks and such that reflects their experiences. And that's why the sitcom, I believe it's George Lopez, is a very interesting development because we're, we're seeing recognition that we have a large group of Americans and it's time, it, from this background, it's time that their experiences are also reflected in the mainstream media. I want to interject here, <coughs> up on the screen, uh, about your book. I, uh, other people will certainly want to read it. And, First of all, it's in our library at North Idaho College, and they'll put up the telephone number for North Idaho College where they could talk with Denise Clark, but also there's a website where uh, the book can be purchased. And so if our staff will put that up, uh, that could be helpful. And there it is on the screen now, and, and they can write that down. And with that, uh, we'll go to Erna Reinhardt. We have uh, about three minutes left. Dominic, um, we have come a long ways, uh, but, but the world isn't a, our country isn't a perfect country yet. But if you looked at, it, at our society, um, as three different components, the, the business world, the political world, and education. Is there one of those that is maybe doing a better job than the others in terms of diversity, um, in terms of embracing diversity? That's, 
really a, a, a neat question. Um, I would say, if I, as I think about it, probably education. Now, before I say any more, a lot of a, a number of our friends on the left would say that we we do have a long way to go, and I think all Americans would acknowledge we have progress that has to be made, even if they're on the the right on the, of the political spectrum. In politics, in corporate America, uh, uh, many uh, white liberals and a fair number of people of color would make the argument that everyone says the right things. So there's a, a rhetorical emphasis on inclusion. But when it comes to follow through, that it's more mixed. And people would make that criticism about education as well. But of the three, as I think about it, I would have to say that I think we're making a bit more progress in terms of education. There's a time, or we're at a point today in our evolution as a nation and as a people where someone who grows up in a predominantly white part of the country and goes to our public schools is going to be exposed in the lesson plans and in the books and, and, and the film strips and such to a fair amount of coverage of all the groups that make up our country. And there was a time, uh, even when I was a young person, uh, when, and when I was going through school, and that wasn't the case. And it wasn't that, there, there was like a, a period of, of evolution where the, the, the treatment went from being overtly exclusionary to, <laughs> to not, not really exclusionary so much, because after the advances of the Civil Rights Movement, that was really unfashionable. I'm sorry to interrupt. The okay. clock has caught up with us, but the great news, Dominic will be back with us next week. We so appreciate your time, and we look forward to continuing your discussion of this really fascinating book called Visible Differences, Why Race Will Matter to Americans in the 21st Century. And as I said at the beginning of the program, it's by Continuum Publishers. And again, next week we'll be able to give you more information of how to get the book, and we will continue our conversation with this very gifted author. Again, I want to repeat that a number of reviewers have indicated that they believe that this is the most comprehensive work that has ever been done in this country in a publication about race in America. In particular, this book emphasizes five races and ethnic groups in our country. We hope you'll be with us again at that time when we will discuss this, or continue to discuss this important book with our guest, Dominic Polera. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you have a very nice week, and please be with us again next week. Thank you. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.